Hallelujah. So Lord, right now there's just so much to say. So much to ask for. So much to talk about, Lord. But right now we just say, your will be done. Lord, not only your will be done, but Lord, give us the strength to actually live the life of your will being done. Give us the courage and knowledge to understand your will being done. Lord, give us the peace with your will being done. Help us be okay, Lord. Even if we don't know how you're going to have your will be done, that we can come alongside of it and honestly say, Lord, your will be done. In Jesus' precious name, we pray for the rest of this service that you have your way. Anoint the man of God that he will speak a word in season, Lord, that that will not just challenge us, but that will change us. A word that will bring transformation because it's built on the life, death, and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. So let me say, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before you see it, find a man and tell him Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Thank you, Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Where are you going? Get back in. Good morning. You look blessed, all blessed and highly favored this morning. Come on, let's give our fathers another round of applause, love, and appreciation. I sent a, a group text to my sons who are fathers this morning. I said, I said, Happy Father's Day. Thank you for being responsible for what you created. <laughs> and I got a lot of love back from them. And isn't that what it's all about? Being responsible for what we create. We are possessors of nothing but stewards of everything. And that's why when Minister Reggie spoke to the parents to let them know that they are essentially stewards over the life of a child. You don't really own that child. And I know we say, I brought you into this world <laughs> and I can take you out. We got it on recording now. <laughs> but the reality is that we are stewards really possessors of nothing because we don't take anything with us when we leave we leave the way we came in and that's the reality another thing I want to point out if I can the importance of family the importance of community we don't grow in isolation we only grow in community. And I read somewhere where it said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some are. And that was written 2,000 years ago. Before COVID. Before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant that even then, in the life of the early church, believers were not understanding and appreciating the importance of this gathering, this coming together. And of course, COVID and pop culture mm -hmm. has influenced and impacted that. But you see, in the, it's in the context of community, people with shared values, shared visions and dreams and journeys and ups and downs, 
around the centrality of our relationship with Christ. It is in that context that we really grow. Minister Reggie again started listing names of men that he watched that helped him become a better man to understand what responsibility is and all of the characteristics of manhood and fatherhood are all about. But he could only experience that in community. So it's within the community that we learn, that we grow, that we have models, not just of manhood, but of womanhood, of godliness, etc. So I couldn't help but sit and watch all that was happening and think about how important community is. You and I were talking uh, on the way. He's driving in his car somewhere along the road, and <laughs> I'm driving in my car, and we're talking about the service and talking about uh, things that we're going to anticipate or even uh, make happen with, within the service. And Pastor Jamal brought up praying for pastors uh, and leaders right now because it seems like one story after another is coming out about the fall of another spiritual leader, another spiritual father. And we pray not just for them and their families, but for unfortunate victims yeah. Yeah. along the way because of failings. And I think about all of this, and on, on, uh, it was Good Friday evening that I spoke here and shared that my one objective is to finish well. And I think that's so important to have so many years, and you don't want all that to go down the drain. Um, you want to finish well and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We need fathers in our lives. Mm -hmm. And fathers are under attack in our nation, in our society. So please don't underestimate the, the challenges that come with taking on responsibilities like this, especially publicly, high profile, mm -hmm. because we get hit in ways that you cannot imagine. Men, build into your lives those protections that will protect you not only from outside forces, but from you. Yeah. Because we can become our first, our, our, our worst enemy if we don't build into our lives things that protect us and create boundaries and protections. So that's just so, so important. I'm overwhelmed over the last week by all the different reports and things that are coming out and I can see the bigger picture of what's happening because if you attack the leaders you know the scripture says smite the shepherd and the sheep scatter yeah and um, you know a lot of our, our clergy are being hit hard and the innocent suffer for the guilty because we're all judged by the one or the two or the three so yeah I'm feeling Father's Day I'm feeling for wives who've recently lost their husbands, who are experiencing their first Father's Day, and children who lost their fathers, who are experiencing their first Father's Day. You know, I, holidays take on a new meaning mm -hmm. because of the circumstances and situations that occur as part of the reality of human experience. So our prayers go out um, touching many, many aspects of life and life experiences. And we want you to know that you're in our prayers. Uh, on Friday, we experienced our 1100th day of prayer. Uh, those of you, how many are online praying with us on the prayer call Monday uh, through Friday? And every milestone like that, I get to come in and, and share. Um, but it's about community. It's about family. Family is a protected institution regulated by government. Marriage is not just romantic love coming together. Marriage is a conjugal relationship toward bonding and procreation. 
and it is protected by government and regulated by government because it has a public effect. Can you say that again? <laughs> Even though we didn't go to the housekeeping, but that's a great statement. Uh, marriage. <laughs> okay, time to get your notebooks out. Come on, let's get off our pads and our phones and, well, and our well, computers. Well, I, it just, you know, I'm thinking about family. I'm thinking about the institution. I, you know, because we've reduced marriage to, well, if I love you, you love me, let's hook up, boom. <laughs> you know, that can happen in so many ways and, and, and redefined. But what God established is more than just romantic love. It's a conjugal relationship toward bonding and procreation and that's why it's regulated by government because it has a public effect what happens in the context of family affects what happens within society generationally you look for the family when the kids are acting up or whatever I mean a whole set of regulations within society came out of that institution called family. And that's very, very real. And we've diminished it, yep. you know, to, to just, I love you, you love me, you know, let's hang out. Or I need sex, you need sex, let's do this. You know, you do you. Yeah, these are, this is the language. Yeah, it, 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 it's sad because some of it is uh, uh, marriage is starting to take on a, a very extreme uh, style of Nuances, whether it's, 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 it's two individuals getting married because it benefits uh, the, the, both individuals economically, right? There's not love. There's no. It's, it's, it's strictly platonic, but you know this is, makes sense financially, right? So it starts becoming a business arrangement, and no longer something that stems from a, a love, you know, procreation, yeah. companionship base. That's why God called it. A, you know, God has given it to us as a sacrament. Mm -hmm. It is something that's holy yep, sacred. and if we don't treat it that way mm -hmm. you know we, we we degrade it to what we're seeing in its current prescribed forms by uh, the culture yeah, you got the beards you got you know they call the, the the guy who's dating a girl I'm marrying a girl who really is dealing with some uh, some issues and they call it a beard where the girl is just there to make him look good in, in public and vice versa you never heard about that? <laughs> They're doing that stuff out there? Yes, you guys, there's some of this, this. There is such. Somebody asked me, they said, Pastor Jamal, why is society so chaotic? I said, well, I said, if you, if you disrupt the family structure, and that's why some people are so against traditional. Um, you know, uh, uh, anti-traditional, right? Anti-traditional, I think, but there's certain things... So, uh, the traditional form of marriage. Yes, yeah, and I think there's certain things that traditional brings to the table that we cannot uh, dismiss. And some of the traditional, the, the, the traditional fatherhood, the traditional motherhood, the traditional household has brought... If you look at society and you, and you look at where we are, the further we get away from the traditional ordained institution of a household, the closer we get to more a chaotic environment. Say that again. <laughs> I'm trying to try to remember. <laughs> the further away we get from the traditional ordained institutional uh, family structure that God designed uh, the closer we get to more chaotic environment. Yeah. And that's what you're starting to see. Yeah. You, you know, and uh, it, it's sad because my children's children, right? You got, like, can I be real with the conversation? I hope so. You got women who are... Oh, wait, wait a minute. We're going to talk about the women? <laughs> no, good thing. No, well, not good things, but it's more so goes towards the men, but okay. You want him to continue with this? You're just nosy. You got women who are going through a process of compromise where now there's another style of things where they are renting a husband. 
because they can't find. Where have I been? <laughs> so many young individuals, right? You, you, How many people <laughs> said me too? <laughs> because they can't find a man, right? And, and the reason why they can't find, you know, this so-called man for a couple of reasons, but you start tracking things back, you know, years ago, and you look at the absence of a man, and now we're starting to really see the residual effects of 30, 40, 50 years of the absence of the man in the household. Or let me say a dad, a father in the household, where now you're starting to see both on the male and female perspective of that, how bro the brokenness is at such an extreme level that we cannot even come to a place where we are able to see the things necessary for us to move towards a, a better future for the next generation, the generation after generation. We, we've had enough time to really see in the modern age yes. the effects of the absence of a father. Yes. The absence of a man within society. And let me say, uh, my, my mom, single parent mom, did the best she could with me, I'm sure. And uh, single parent mothers, you are raising children and you're doing the best that you can. I affirm you, I compliment you, I encourage you, I salute you for stepping in. But there is a reality that is that you can provide but so much, even in the absence, especially in the absence of a male uh, figure or of a man in your life. It is the God-ordained union and model and I was, if I may, and, and, and I know, and I'm going to ask as a spiritual father for your forgiveness, because I promise you that I would get into wilderness today and do part two. But I will tell you, I, I was just moved deeply by what we celebrate today. I called PJ, I said, we haven't ministered together in a while. Let's talk about fatherhood and legacy, and let's engage a conversation around this reality today. All right, so do I have your forgiveness? Good. Sometimes it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Can I really quick, real quick housekeeping, uh, if I may, because I don't want to disturb you once you, you start getting into the heart of the conversation. And uh, so I'm, I'm... While you talk, I'm going to write something. Or, uh, but you got to pay attention to me, not to, to the writing. Some of you are trying to cheat already. What are you writing? What? And so, so I got some giveaways. It's uh, white and blue uh, for the men, for the fathers. Uh, and and it, says, it says, Dr. Cole said this statement. He said, you're a male by birth, but a man by choice. Right? And so what we, we continue that statement. It says, only any male can be a father, but it takes a special man to be a dad. And so, so don't worry, we're giving this out for free, so I don't have to worry about saying, you know, whose birthday is today, don't worry, balcony, you're good, we, I, I believe we have enough. Uh, please take one, uh, men uh, and uh, ladies, don't say, oh, well, he's not here, he's not here, so I'm gonna take, no, ladies, all right? And then for those who are watching online, we, we have a uh, um, uh, uh, discount code for you to go shopping at our bookstore. And the discount code is Father's Day, one word, Father's Day 2024. Uh, for those who are viewing online, something that we're trying to do, because my thing is, like, I, I want to you know, bring back the uniqueness and specialness, uh, if that's a, a phrase I can use, to Father's Day. You know, somebody asked me, you know, what are you doing for Father's Day? Are you barbecuing? I said, no, I'm not barbecuing. I said, I'm actually allowing myself to be cooked for. <laughs> Come on. I barbecue all summer. I, my, my wife gets a good time off. I'm always barbecuing ribs, you know, smoking some, you know, some burnt ends, some briskets and stuff like that. I'm seasoning it the day before, you know, stuff like that. But no, today I am going to be treated. So men. But you can only be treated if you have that t-shirt. <laughs> no, no, you just, you just look good while you're being treated. Good. If you have this t-shirt. Yes, but uh, no, seriously, here, here goes the principle. The level of significance you put on it tends to create, okay, let me change this. The degree of significance you put on it tends to start creating the degree that others will put on it. 
So men, husbands, fathers, if you don't put a significance on today, then you can't expect somebody else to put a significance on today. Today is not just any other day. It's Father's Day. All right, own it. Enjoy it. I'm going to milk it. So <laughs> happy Father's Day. <laughs> Oh, and that being said, we have, because uh, we, we were trying to rack our brains on what to do for Father's Day, and we didn't know what to do for Father's Day, and we didn't want to be cheesy, and they got so many gifts out there for Mother's Day. There's so much that's out there for Mother's Day. They, they dis like, we're down, like, on number 20 on the top holidays. So, so, I, like, they don't respect us, man. We got to get our respect back. There's something, and some of it's our fault. Some of the lack of respect for Father's Day is our fault. We got to own it. But it's time to take it back, right? We've got to move it up the list. Well, you, you, you're raising issues here because I wanted to know why you can't get a reservation for a restaurant on Mother's Day. Yeah, no, it's right. And you can get coupons for Father's Day. Hold on. <laughs> and and, 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 and it's, 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 it's serious, right? Uh, so we're doing a barbecue, uh, just hot dogs, hamburgers, some side foods. Just also say thank you to the Wait, the outside, others, outside, yeah, outside. service? My, my thing was, I was going to say, I said, I told Pastor Bernard, I said, Daddy, look, I'm going to get all the fathers, all the men, we're going to go hang out, bring our beach chairs, we're going to put some big screen TVs on, we're going to have service outside, barbecuing, we're going to do a cook-off, everybody they bring their own barbecue pit, but he said, that's a lot of work. I'm like... <laughs> which, the, which the women will end up doing. That's what I'm saying. No, we do a cook-off and stuff like that. But gonna, it's free. Yeah, it's free. Uh, go out there. Um, we're, we're trying to give to the men first so you get the coupons, but then we try to bless the family. We're trying, we're trying so hard to come up with some ideas. I know I'm going to get uh, uh, some, some, some feedback, both negative and positive, because of some of the things that we decided to do. But we're trying to do it just for the fathers. We don't do anything for the fathers. We do a lot of stuff for the men, I mean for the women. Uh, and we're really just trying to value the father. All the women that are clapping, that's beautiful. Because I honestly, I thank God I had a father in my life. I truly thank God. And I understand it's hard to celebrate Father's Day with the daddy wound, you know, with, you know, with, with, with the hurt that has come, you know, from not having a father there. But I think it's time to forgive, let go, so that we can start perpetuating some positivity for the next generation. And we're going to talk about the legacy. But yeah, barbecue outside. Is that good, preacher? Let me, let me insert something very important also. The marriage model that we subscribe to, all right, which I said is, is, is more than just romantic love. It, it's a, it's a conjugal, conjugal relationship towards bonding and procreation. It is a social reality that predates Christianity mm -hmm. because we keep getting blamed for this model. Yep. This model predates us. And that's very, very important as you are challenged about, well, you Christians believe one way, we, we don't believe that. No, it, it existed before Christianity. It is a global social reality that predates us in every society around the world and throughout human history the particular model that we subscribe to. So please, when people challenge you on that, say, hey, we didn't, we didn't come up with this. God came up with this, and it predates our Christian identification and Christian uh, context. Amen. I just wanted to get that out there because I love Christianity, love Christians, love Jesus. And, and I want to give a special shout out to CCC. We are in the building. Usually Father's Day drops for a lot of churches. I just want to say thank you for coming out. Fathers, thank you for making it such an important time of going to church, going to service as a part of your day. So thank you so much. Please see you in the building. So I put three things on the board and I share with you out of the overflow of my own personal studies and devotion. Um, people ask me, well, you know, how long did it take you to prepare for that message? All my life. <laughs> Because essentially, you benefit from the aggregate of my spiritual journey, growth, experiences, uh, etc. And, 
as I think about where we are as a society and the importance of our presence as salt and light, I also think about the importance of our ability to clearly articulate what we believe and why we believe what we believe. That is just so, so important. So when I think about human history in general, human history is an intricate weave of individual threads. Their actions, their achievements, their beliefs, and their failures. Let me reorganize that. I'll say it again. Human history is an intricate weave of individual threads. And what I mean by individual threads, I can switch that. The threads of individual lives. Mm -hmm. In fact, better said, an intricate, intricate, intricate weave of the thread of individual lives. So each individual life is a thread in human history. Each individual life is a thread in human history. You are a thread in the intricate weave of human history. Now, say, well, I'm just a thread. Don't belittle a thread. Mm -hmm. Because if you find the right thread and pull on it, yep. you can unravel an entire sweater. Sometimes a whole outfit. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So you cannot diminish the value of a thread. But there are billions of people on the planet now and throughout history. Many, many people. So many, many threads. And when you bring them together, they create this, this pattern that, which is essentially a tapestry of time and influence from generation to generation. So when, when you think of human history, and remember what we were talking about, if I may extract something from part one of wilderness, how we perceive things determines how we experience them. Mm -hmm. Right? How we perceive things determines how we experience them. So how we perceive history, how we perceive our lives, our, our, ourselves, our relationship, etc. You know, and perception is how we interpret. Perception is how we interpret things. So however you interpret circumstances, situations, and realities around you and events, that will determine how you experience it. How you interpret God determines how you experience God. If you think that God, if you interpret God as this, this angry individual that's waiting to bash you over the head with, with, you know, every time you sin, all right, then you're going to experience God like that. And there are people who have experienced God like that because this is what they were exposed to. And they left the church. They turn against God. They turn against religion, against faith because of an erroneous representation of God. So how we interpret things influences how we experience it. And say that again. How we interpret church. Ah, I don't want to go to church. Church is a bunch of hypocrites, blah, blah, blah. How many of you ever heard of that kind of <laughs> before, right? So we're interpreting church in a certain way mm -hmm. that's influencing how we experience church. Church is filled with people who are on a journey. People who are once broken and wounded, detached from God, and now reconnected and are receiving the life of God that's creating transformation in our hearts, our minds, our emotions, and our experiences. So human history, if I can just adjust the lens through which you see and understand history at large, because you are, how many realize you're a part of history? Absolutely. You are part of history. And although you are a thread, don't think of that as being small or insignificant. Again, you know, I've been there where I pulled on a thread and everything started coming apart. Just one thread. Turn to your neighbor. Say, you're a thread, but you're significant. So, so human history is an, is an intricate weave. And when you think about weave, you're thinking about twisting and 
turning to avoid obstruction, but moving in a definite direction. You get that? In a fight, you're, you're bobbing and what? Weaving. Weaving. What are you doing? You are twisting and turning to avoid getting hit. All right? But in, in, in a pattern, the, the whole idea of weaving is twisting and turning to get through obstructions that are there in order to go in and out and create the continuity of that pattern. So human history is an intricate weave of individual, or, or I mean, let me change that, of threads of individual lives. Let me change that on here. All right, so now you know how my mind works. I'm constantly reflecting even while I'm talking on what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. Individual lives, your individual life. But, but here's what's important, all right? So you are a thread. You are an individual life. You are a thread that's part of the intricate weave of human history. But what's significant and what makes you significant are your actions, your beliefs, your achievements, and your failures. So that thread, you, is made up of what? Because you are passing these on to the next generation. How many know your actions have effect. How many know your beliefs have effect? How many know your achievements have effect? Your failures have effect. Because each one of us is a combination of our what? How we handle these things. influences the effect that we have from generation to generation. You are a thread. So life, or which, which means legacy, because of what we want to talk about today, and that's why I called Pastor Ramal and I said, you know, we haven't ministered together in a, in a while. Let's, let's, let's just do this. Legacy essentially is, is, is a tapestry of time and influence. It's a tapestry of time and influence. And when we step back and, and look at human history or step back and look at our lives or look at our family, what are we seeing? We're seeing all the individuals that we know as part of our family and they're a thread and they're going in a particular direction and they're twists and turns along the way, but all part of the pattern that's being created. We're making decisions. We're taking actions. We are developing certain beliefs. Those beliefs expand over time. We are achieving things, and we're experiencing failures. And I know you'd like to cut this part out, right? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Failure, failure is the womb, is the womb. for success. For success. Try that one more time. That needs to marinate. Say it with me. Failure is the womb for success. 
cannot tell you how many successes have been born out of failure. How many of you experience success born out of failure? Because failure can motivate you to get it right. It can inspire you to dig deeper, to bring out the best of yourself in response to the challenge, to the task at hand. And I don't know how many times you've had to dig deep, but I will tell you, as you move from one level of life to another, all right, you have to learn how to dig deeper because life becomes deeper. Relationships become deeper. And that's why reflection, daily reflection on your actions, your beliefs, your achievements, and your failures will help to shape you into a better person, a stronger person, a more savvy person, a more aware person that makes for a successful person. So this is not just me looking at human history, the grand picture, but it's also daily. It's what you go through on a daily basis. What you believe about yourself, what you believe about God. And just going back to some of the things that we started talking about, how many heard of this? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How many heard that? Mm -hmm. You people didn't hear that yet. <laughs> You're scaring me, folks. How many heard, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength? So your primary relationship is vertical. And that's your relationship with God. In fact, every other relationship that you have other than God occupies a horizontal plane. Which means you should never worship God any relationship on a horizontal plane. There's only one relationship that's 90 degrees, and that's God. Amen? Amen. Yahweh. <laughs> that's the only vertical relationship that you should have. Every other relationship in this 90 degree angle is horizontal. It's a horizontal plane. That's how we look at it. But notice the second part of that. Love God, right? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that sounds good depending upon how you love you. Because the way I see some people love themselves, God, don't love me, please. <laughs> some people don't like themselves. They're angry with themselves. They're hurt and broken and wounded and, 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 and it's all caught up in that self. And here's the problem. When you try to love out of that self, horizontally only, you have nothing vertical coming into your soul as an anchor. And here's what's happening in society. We are trying to love others as we love ourselves, without loving God. Are you hearing me? So your ability to love self and love others depend, is directly proportionate to your relationship with God. Because it is God who provides the anchor for our soul. That protects us from what we can become when our humanity runs out. Because when our humanity runs out, we tend to give in to the forces of fear and greed and lust and fame and power and all of the other things that society offers us apart from God. It's false narratives. It's false uh, counterfeit loves, counterfeit values. I, I did something the other day, and, and maybe I'll get to share it. I don't know. I, I'll have to share it. Yeah, yeah, you know what? It'll be, it'll be Spiritual Warfare 3. Did I do 3 yet? <laughs> it'll be... I sat back and said, okay, 
if I were the devil and I wanted to undermine the authority of God, what would I do? I became a bad person. In the process of trying to think that through, it blew me away. The ways that that can manifest itself. And all it did was tell me what's going on already within our society. I would get rid of moral values. I would undermine moral values. I will try to convince society that we don't need moral values or morality is relative or situational. There is no standard. There is no universally applied standard of morality. I would quickly unravel that so people can decide on their own what's good and what's not good, what's moral and what's not moral, how we should conduct ourselves within a, a given society. Our social construct is based upon morality and boundaries. And I said, wow, I would eliminate the vertical so that people could only live on the horizontal. And if they live only on the horizontal plane without God, they're going to self-destruct because they're already broken and wounded and messed up and trying to find good, do good, be good. But without a moral compass, without an anchor, it's not going to happen. So I would, I would undermine churches and pastors and preaching and the Bible. I mean, anything that, that presents a moral standard or a set of moral values, I would attack all of that to destabilize the possibility of people experiencing good. I was in, um, in Austin, Texas, shooting a segment for a new show that we're, we're working on. This particular segment is about near-death experiences. These are people who have been clinically dead. They, their heart stopped, their brain stopped functioning, the longest period was someone who was dead for three days and came back to life. And I'm interviewing people and they're sharing stories of what they experienced while they were clinically dead. The fact that they had consciousness, the fact that they could see and feel, analyze, observe, evaluate, because there are, there are questions even within our faith about the immortality of the soul. Does the soul continue after we, dead? We, we die physically? And one guy who is now a pastor in, 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 in Texas, in Austin, Texas, all right, he was cocaine, methamphetamines, he was doing it. His life was a mess and he knew it and he overdosed on cocaine and he was clinically dead and he said while he was in this, this state he felt himself dropping and everything was dark and he said that he was fighting and he kept going down 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 these are not those stories where people visited hell and they saw God no. He kept going down, 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 down. And, and something came back to him that he was exposed to when he was a kid about Jesus. And he rejected it, even while he was falling down. And he said the more he rejected it, the faster he began to fall. And he said what he noticed most was as he was falling, he was moving away from light from goodness, from compassion, from peace, from love, things that he, he experienced to a degree while he was still alive, but he found himself moving further and further and further away. I could not, you know, uh, express better than the way he did the reality that to be apart from God and the further you move away from God, the further you move away from the nature of God. 
God is good. So if you move away from God, you remove, you, you, you remove your way away from goodness. God is love. So the further you are from God, the further you are from love. God is light. So the further you are from God, the further you are from light. How many understand what I'm talking about here? And he was feeling it. And, 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 and he said it. One moment, he just cried out. And all of a sudden, he stopped falling. And he started coming back up. And as he came back up, and notice up and down is how he was describing it, he could see what was happening around him, but couldn't communicate with it. There was another woman, I was up in, um, in Clayton, New York, and her experience was that she was lifted, elevated, and saw the operating room and the doctors and everybody that was working. And she experienced peace, compassion, empathy, all those things. And she didn't want to go back because of the broken life that she was experiencing. She too was drugs and alcohol, things like that. And she didn't, she didn't want to go back. And she said that this was more real to her. This environment was more real to her than the environment that she was in when she was here on earth. So you'll hear more about the show when it comes out and share with you incredible stories. And these people are not making stuff up. I mean, this was real to them. And as they conveyed the story, you can feel the realness of it, the reality of it. I say that to say that if we develop only on a vertical plane, apart from God, we as a society will move further and further away from the things that make us good and make us for goodness and give us peace and love and empathy and understanding. So, legacy is essentially what we leave behind once we've gone through our actions, our beliefs, our achievements, and our failures. The Bible says in Proverbs 13.22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Did you get that? To his children's children. So Pastor Jamal doesn't get the inheritance. The grandchildren get it. How do you feel about that? <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> but when we think about legacy, mm -hmm. what we leave behind, right? Legacy is first spiritual. And whether you're trying to leave one or not, you're going to leave one. You want to elaborate on that, Pastor? Elaborate on the fact that we're going to leave a legacy, good or not. We're still going to leave a legacy. It's right there. That's it. That's it. <laughs> um, see how you just do, do. By the way, he's he's getting he's getting it's coming from the chat or yeah, he's getting text messages in response to our conversation. That's his job <laughs> as well. Yeah, somebody sent me um, updated uh, um, stats on Father's Day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they gave you some stats? Mm -hmm. There's stats out there? Yeah. People yeah. actually measure? Yeah, they're actually gonna, they said that they're actually going to spend more money this Father's Day than other Father's Day they have spent before. Who's spending the money? The people. People are spending money, more money this Father's Day? The question is, is it going to the father, though? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they just got good discounts, good deals, right? You know, I don't know if the fathers are getting it, but, you know, this. But uh, the, 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 the first thing I was saying is the spiritual legacy, and it looks at the, the significance of it. Uh, I, I don't think that it's all, only in order of one, two, three, but uh, more so of significance, because if we don't realize and be intentional about what we leave behind, then anything can swoop in and become, take this place of what should be left behind. I say it again, if you don't, if we're not intentional about what we leave behind, anything can swoop in and become, take its place for what should be left behind. And, and the, the, the essence of the spiritual aspect, it, 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 
creates a foundation and a rooting place for everything else to flow out of that, mm. right? So uh, who we are, uh, somebody asked me, you know, uh, looking at 1 Peter 3.15, he says, at, uh, depending on what translation you read, but he says, at, above all else, keep Christ center of your life, right? And then be prepared to give an answer for what you believe and why you believe what you believe. This is Jamalism. And when I look at that and I see that at the center, if Christ is at the center, that means the center dictates how everything else revolves around you, right? So it, it, it dictates the spatiality of certain things, right? So whatever's at the center, whatever is the core of who you are, this, your, your spiritual being, uh, it becomes the, 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 the voice on how you relate to everything else outside of that. So everything else is an expression of that centrality. Yes. It comes from what's happening yes. inside yep. that foundation. So, mm. so you, you, you interact, your, your interactions are dictated by what's at center, your, 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 the closeness of whatever you're interacting with is, is based on what's at center. Uh, your, 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 the way you manage and steward certain things is based on what is at the center. So if your, your, your center is not centered, <laughs> then you can be out of balance and out of alignment and everything else outside of that starts Come on. Come on. problems and issues start arising and you start saying, okay, why is this happening? And the question is, what are you centered on? Right, right. Whoa, is that real time? We're going to have to do part two of this? <laughs> Listen, Jesus said, when the evil spirit is cast out, how many are familiar with the text? When the evil spirit is cast out, it goes about mm -hmm. seeking a place of rest. If it finds none, it returns. Yeah looking to see if the place that it was cast out of is, vacant. is filled. He said if it's swept and garnished because evil was removed but not filled, then the evil spirit returns and returns with reinforcements mm -hmm. to make sure it's not so easily removed. Yep. the way it was the first time. It goes and seeks seven more spirits worse than itself mm -hmm. in order to secure itself back into that house from which, which, from which it was cast out. Evil loves a vacuum. Yeah, say that again. Evil loves a vacuum. And it's looking to fill that void with evil. So if legacy is first spiritual, and you don't have spirituality, if you don't have a spiritual foundation, then what you're leaving to the next generation is a spiritual void, mm -hmm. a spiritual vacuum. And evil is going to look to fill that vacuum. Do you understand how important this is, how real this is? Because you're going to pass on a spirituality to your family, to your children, to your grandchildren. You're going to pass on a spirituality. You have no idea the blessing of one of my grandchildren coming to me and saying to me, he said, Pop, the best gift you gave me is your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Your knowledge of God is the best gift that you've ever given me. And for that, for that young man to understand this, to get it, that was an incredible blessing to me. So you're going to pass on a spirituality. It's going to be a void that will be filled by evil, or it's going to be filled by the knowledge of God and your own personal experiences in relationship to God. When you think of spirituality, if I may, don't think of it as just going to church or being part of a religion. No, your spirituality tells you who or what ultimate reality is. Your spirituality is your connection to God. 
and in our faith tradition to Yahweh, to Jesus Christ. How many understand what I'm talking about? Because it's through your spirituality that you answer the big questions. Your spirituality tells you what or who or what is God. What is ultimate reality? Because this is not ultimate. This is broken. So there's got to be something greater than this, above and beyond this. Your spirituality teaches you, tells you, and reinforces in you what is ultimate reality. Number two, your spirituality tells you what it means to be human. Being human is spiritual, folks. It's not physical. It is expressed through the physical body as the temple of God's presence. But existence, as it is revealed to us in Scripture, God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. But it was that breath that entered him, that animated him animated this body and gave him identity and gave him personality and released him towards the dominion mandate. So your spirituality teaches you what it means. What does it mean to be human? And it begins for us with the imago Dei, the image of God. Then your spirituality teaches you what it means to live in this world. What does it mean to live in this world? world, to relate to people, to circumstances, to experiences, to situations, to, to constructs, to systems and structures and values and beliefs that, that, that represent the multiplicity of human thought. Your spirituality establishes firmly in you what it means to live in this world. Your spirituality is what gives you your sense of meaning and purpose. So to not have a spirituality, to not have this intentionally passing it on. My passion and excitement is that all of my children believe in God. All of my children embrace the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They embrace what they've been taught about ultimate reality, what it means for them to be a human being, a human person, what it means for them to be in this world and interact with other human beings. It has given them meaning and purpose. So if you give them a void, then they're going to try to satisfy the answer to these questions amongst a place of deception and lies instead of truth and reality. So when it says a good man, a good man, I want to speak in tongues. <laughs> a good man, which is a man that subscribes to his higher self, his true self, his transcendent self, in the image and likeness of God, a good man leaves an inheritance, a legacy to not just his children, but he has so impacted his children that they're passing it on to their children. So it has a third generation effect. Take this out of society. Society becomes bankrupt. We begin to come up with our own ideas of what reality is, what truth is. Is your truth and my truth? We come up with our own ideas of what it means to be human. We come up with our own ideas of what it means to live in this world and how we should order and organize society. We, become, we come up with our own ideas as to what meaning is and what purpose is. And usually, usually it leads to destructive results. Because it's rooted in selfishness. Can I tell you folks how necessary we are in the years ahead in our society. Here in America and around the world. We need more than ever to be salt and light. We need fathers to step up and be fathers. Men to step up and be men that God designed them to be. We need spiritual fathers. We need all kinds of fathering and fatherhood to step up, take responsibility, and live out the model because there are people depending on you. I'm sorry to get preachy on this, but... 
It just, this is where we are. This is where we are. So many alternatives and options are being presented to us. It's called chaos. Babel. Confusion. We need specificity. We need accuracy. We need truth. And we believe that we have that. <laughs> One of the uniqueness about the Bible are there's principles, right? And principles are universal truths. And if it's used, it'll work. And what the world has done is seen some of the principles of the fishermen. And that principle of casting a net is biblically based, telling us how to fish for men, how to go after souls. And they're taking the same principle and using it against the church because the church is failing to respond. A line is being drawn, but we're not drawing it anymore. It's the world drawing the line. And if we don't reestablish... Wait, 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 wait. Say that again. <laughs> a line is being drawn. And it's not us drawing the line. It's the world drawing the line. And if we don't reestablish a line that has been dr drawn by God and really start making a stance, we're going to find ourselves losing the perceived battle. And if anything, for your children's children, step up your game, church. For the inheritance that we need to leave and the legacy that we need to leave, I think it's time for us to start moving and no longer accepting your energy, send your energy my way. No. We need to really start taking back certain terminologies of, of yeah, I'm praying for you and really mean it. We need to start taking back certain terminologies and know that God is good. No matter what is happening, we know that God is good. This is not something that we just like to say, but it's something that we believe at the core of who we are. There's some things that we need to start doing in that fatherhood statement. It's so key because men, we need to start taking back fatherhood. And what fatherhood looks like for us, it's the biblical model that we need to start facing towards and stop facing away from. And I thank you, Dad. Because I am a product of somebody turning to a biblical model of not having a father to set the standard, to set the, 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 the pattern and the tone. But you looked at the biblical model of what a fatherhood looks like. And you have raised seven sons that have a desire to be fathers in their lives, their child's lives. So this is an example of no matter what circumstance you're birthed into, no matter what situations you come out of, no matter what lack that you have, if you turn to the biblical model of what it looks like to be a father, what it looks like to be a mother, what it looks like to be a human, it is possible to be successful in a world that's so antagonistic to what we are here to stand for. If you just turn to the biblical narrative, you can see a line being drawn. One that we can be competent and confident in. That no matter what the enemy does, no matter what weapon is formed, we will stand in victory. <laughs> <laughs> we got to pray out. We're done. Or maybe we're just getting started. Thank you for letting us just share our hearts with you today. We got work to do. And, and the metaphors were amazing today. Metaphors help us.
Jesus used metaphor. The kingdom of heaven is like. We need metaphors. And these metaphors that have been placed before us, the thread and the line. You know, while you're talking, I, I kept seeing the enemy draw a line and then step and then draw it and just until took over my territory. We can't let that happen. Amen. Amen. Come on, Pastor. Pray us out. <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah, the anointing is here. Yeah, the anointing is here. Come on. It's just so much to pray for. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, God, you are so good. It's just you can hear the cries. You can hear the brokenness. You can hear at the same time on, on the other end, I can hear the victories. Thank you, oh Lord. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. Every hallelujah that's being lifted in this room, every hallelujah that's being lifted to the King, to the Lord of glory, to the King of kings, to our Abba Daddy. Father, we say thank you for what our eyes have seen on this day. What our ears have heard, what our hearts have perceived. Thank you for quickening in us, oh God, the importance of legacy. And Father, even now, I join my heart with every brother in this place, every brother that's online. Yes. And we rededicate ourselves to you. We submit our legacies to you, oh God. And Father, in submitting our legacy, we submit our doubts, we submit our fears, we submit our failures, we submit our hopes, we submit our dreams. We submit our families, oh God. We yield to you and we trust you. We trust you. Come on, even now, right now, talk to the Lord. Talk to your Father. Come on, talk to your Father. Talk to your Father. And as you speak, hear him respond, peace, healing, deliverance, reconciliation, forgiveness, strength. Oh, Father, we hear your voice. And every time you call our name, we receive your healing. Yeah. Every time you call our names, yeah. we receive your healing. So thank you, oh God, for what you have done and what you have begun on this day. We submit our lives to you. We submit our lives to you. Mm. Mm. 
This is the altar. We submit our lives to you. This is us owning Father's Day. By meeting you at the altar, we submit our lives to you. This is what will set us on the trajectory of change for the rest of our lives. Submitting our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the sons and daughters of the Most High God say amen. Amen. And amen. And amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Thank you, Minister Lamar. I was too full to pray. That's why I threw it, tossed it to him. He tried to toss it back. I'm glad Minister Lamont O'Neill was present. Enjoy your Father's Day as we leave this place, but never God's presence. Come on, let's say it. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful Father's Day. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.